right. Good evening. Good evening. Are you ready for the word? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, uh, for those of you who have been following us, we're going through the New Testament chapter by chapter in chronological order so you can understand the Bible in a much deeper way, in a clearer way, and the way it was intended to be understood in our church history. And today, we'll be speaking on Acts chapter 8. So if you can, please turn to Acts chapter 8. Last time I spoke, on Acts chapter 7, we read about Stephen, one of the seven Hellenistic or Greek believers who was persecuted, who died, who was murdered, who was executed for being a believer. And I quoted one of the famous founding fathers or famous quotes in Christianity, which is, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs yes. is the seed of the church. And we're going to see what happened. Stephen was stoned. He was killed. He was murdered by the religious people. And one of those people, probably the number one enemy of the church, was our friend, the greatest missionary in all of history, Paul, who used to be Saul. Paul was a murderer. Paul was evil, wicked, angry, a terrible person. The guy who wrote half of the New Testament. Okay? God chooses the foolish things of this world to found the wise. But something happened. Paul was there witnessing the death of Stephen. He saw this man die in front of his eyes. The blood that was on the floor. And he was holding coats, approving of what had happened. Now we're going to see the fruits that came from the blood of this godly man of God. Amen? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you for your presence. We ask you for your power. I ask you, God, for the anointing of your spirit and for direction. Order my thoughts, God. I pray, Father, against all distraction in Jesus' name. For those of us who have difficulty understanding the language, I pray that you would help them, God, to understand. Let every seed that enters into the heart not be taken away from the devil, God. We pray against the enemy, every work of Satan, in Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to read chapter 8 of the book of Acts, entitled Philip and the Eunuch. Philip and the Eunuch. Let's start with verses 1 until verse 8. So if you have your Bibles, you can open, if you don't, can look up at the screen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. 
Praise God. This is what happened right after the persecution, or right after Stephen died. If you remember Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we are remembered that Jesus sent the disciples. He says, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the world. Remember this. And now here, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we see that there was a great persecution. And it's amazing that God, His tool, His vehicle, to spread the gospel, to make His word come true, is persecution. Quite possibly, the greatest weapon that God had for the spread of the gospel is the persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. It is the death of the believers. The blood of Stephen is already producing fruit. Many people are coming to Christ. It started out in the church of Jerusalem. And the apostles, they had to stay there. But everyone else left and they were scattered. Scattered to all the nations. This is the power of persecution. Now Saul was a very evil man. But he was dedicated to God and the things of God. A Pharisee of Pharisee, extremely religious and dedicated. In verses 3, in other translations, I believe it says uh, raging. Paul was raging. In the NIV it says destroy the church. But in the original context, the meaning of this word means a wild animal that was ripping everything. So imagine right now, I'm preaching, we're listening, and there's a guy named Saul. He comes here, and he starts taking all of you women and all of you men by your feet, taking you out of this church and killing you. That is exactly what Saul did. Exactly what he did. It wasn't cool to be Christian. To be a Christian was to basically... You don't know if you're going to be alive today or tomorrow. But Paul, he had no mercy. He had no grace. He didn't care if you were a woman. He didn't care if you were a man, a child, tall, short, skinny, fat, smart, intelligent. He didn't care. He took you and he killed you. That is Paul, my friends. But look at this. When we look at verse 3 and 4, even though Paul was killing all these people, persecuting the church, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Who is a preacher? Who? Raise your hand if you are a preacher. Everyone is a preacher. That's what the Bible it says here. Those who have been scattered. When persecution comes, my brothers and sisters, you will be preaching like you've never preached before. If you've never preached, you will be preaching. Now, the preaching is not just for the pastor or the evangelist. It is for every person that is in the body of Christ preaches the Word of God. And when persecution comes, that is when we're going to see our preaching happen even more. And persecution, yes, we see persecution happen in the world today. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We have situations like in China, Iran, the Middle East. They are killing believers because they are believers in Jesus Christ. Last time I preached, I told you about the 20 Egyptians Actually, 19 Egyptians and one individual from Ghana who had their heads cut off by the Muslim extremists, the Islamic extremists, because they were the people of the cross. Exact words. And their blood 
were shed on the beach of Libya. But through their blood, I believe many people will come to Christ. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. And today it's happening again. In Brazil, it's not happening not this way, but it's happening other ways. Persecution is coming through the political system. Politics are persecuting the Christians. The ideology of today is persecuting the Christians. If you are against homosexuality, if you are against abortion, if you are against these things, they will persecute you. They are persecuting us, but they will not win. Because when persecution comes, the church grows even more. The church grows even more. That is what's happening right now. Then we have our friend Philip. Who remembers Philip? Okay. Philip is the apostle, yes? No. He is one of the seven. One of the seven Hellenistic believers who was chosen to help the widows or the women who had no husbands who died. Stephen was one of them, filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened? He died. Now we have Philip, who is also filled with the Spirit of God. And he went down to Samaria, Samaria, and proclaimed the Messiah there. The Jews did not speak to the Samaritans. They were their enemies. Greatest enemies. Biggest enemies. Okay? In, co in a cultural aspect, I'm going to give you one of my favorite cultural examples. Someone who's a Cruzeiro fan is not going to preach to the electrical fans with the good news. They don't like each other. They hate each other. It goes back into the history of the histories. Okay? It just doesn't happen. They're enemies. Culturally, they're enemies. They don't like each other. Even if they don't even know one player in the team. They don't know. They don't like each other. It's incredible. But this goes back about 700 years before Christ, around the time of Solomon. The kingdom of Israel was divided into two. The north kingdom and the southern kingdom. The north kingdom, Israel, capital, Samaria. And the southern kingdom, Judah, capital, Jerusalem. The people in the north, what did they do? The Assyrians came in and they captured the kingdom and they began to mix the Jewish people with the pagans. And those in Judah looked at them and said, you guys are impure. You are not real Jewish people. You guys are pagans. You don't worship the true God. And from that point until Probably even today, they hate each other. There's about 800 Samaritans alive today in the world. But the Jewish people believe they were the highest race, the number one race. They were the pure race. And they hated the Samaritans. Even when they were rebuilding the wall, who remembers Nehemiah? When they were rebuilding the wall, they rejected the help of the Samaritans. Even Nehemiah rejected the help. They did not like the Samaritan people. Enemies. But what happens here? Philip goes to Samaria. And he proclaims the Messiah, Jesus Christ. To the enemies of the Jewish people. The pure Jewish people. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Philip goes to Samaria and he's performing signs and wonders. People are getting healed. Demons are being cast out. Miracles are happening in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Miracles happen to bring people to Christ, not for the glory of one person. It's for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. Who wants to be used to do miracles? 
Who wants to do miracles for the glory of God? Less people. Come on, just more people. Okay? It will only happen when you are filled with the Spirit to be witnesses. Remember what a witness is, yes? Who wants to be a witness? A witness is someone who's filled with the Spirit of God and who's going to die for Jesus Christ. To be a witness is to be someone who will die for what they believe. And Philip comes, he's healing the sick, he's transforming lives, and there was great joy in the city. Who is happy that they are believers today? Who's happy to be a believer today? Okay. The fruit of salvation is joy. When you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, a spirit of joy comes into your heart. When you came to Christ, were you sad? Yes? Okay, it's not my problem. For those of you who came to Christ, you were happy, filled with joy, filled with life, that is the Spirit of God. And that is what happened in that time. Now let's continue. Verse 9 to 25. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for, for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished, by the great signs and miracles he saw when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying of the hands of the apostles, at the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord, and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. God is amazing. Philip is filled with the power of God, and the power of God, the Spirit of God, is doing exactly what He's doing. Changing lives, transforming lives, giving life to those who have no life, 
destroying the power of sin, destroying the power of death, destroying the power of Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. And Stephen goes into Samaria and he comes across a man, a sorcerer named Simon. Who knows about Simon? Who's read about Simon? It's an interesting thing. Read about Simon. Simon was a very powerful sorcerer. Very powerful and demonic individual. He had satanic powers. And many people came to him from Samaria, from Israel, from all over the world. Maybe even Rome. People from Rome knew about him. And they came to this man, Simon. He practiced sorcery. And there's a man named uh, Justin Martyr. He wrote that in Rome, in the capital Rome, at that time, there was a statue dedicated to this man, Simon, that said, to Simon, the holy God. They worshipped Simon like a god. He was considered a god in Samaria and in Rome and in parts of Israel, Jerusalem. This was a man used by Satan with demonic powers, supernatural powers. And he boasted, I am someone special. I am great. Look at the power that I have. Look at the supernatural abilities that I have. I have the ability to heal and do whatever he did. I don't know what demonic things he did, but you can imagine the demonic power that this man had. And he received attention from everyone. And people began to say, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They were calling Simon the power of God. Incredible. A normal man, a normal human being, being called the great power of God. Some of the founding fathers of Christianity believe this man, he's the one who started the movement of Gnosticism. He started it. He was probably the first one to bring in heretical, demonic doctrine into the church in the early stages. This ridiculous, demonic man by the name of Simon. But what happens? He looks at the power of Stephen, uh, of, of Philip, the supernatural Holy Spirit power, healing the sick, changing lives. And Simon's like, I want this power too. I definitely want this power. And he starts noticing people are leaving his group. They're leaving his little society. And now Philip is getting all of the attention. And there is joy in the city. And Simon does a strategy. He, convert, he becomes a Christian. He believed in the gospel. He believed in the good news. And he was baptized. Okay? He believed. And he was baptized. But then he offers the apostles money to receive the same power that they had. That wasn't a good idea. Because when he said that, they said, may your money perish with you because you thought you can buy the gift of God with money. And you cannot. This was Peter, the apostle. I believe God gave him a supernatural gift of discernment to discern the spirit that is in this man. And he saw that he was a false believer, a false convert. You can accept Jesus Christ. You can be baptized in water and not be a true believer in Jesus Christ. I don't believe everyone that's baptized is a believer. He wasn't. There was a false believer even in the beginning of the church. Faith that does not save. He had a faith that does not save. 
There are two types of faith. Faith that saves and faith that does not save. He had a faith that does not save, but that did not save. And I was listening to a pastor by the name of John MacArthur, and he lists four views that Simon got wrong about Jesus, about the gospel. Four views. Number one, he had the wrong view of self. Simon was a very prideful man, arrogant man. He thought he was God. He allowed people to worship him. Incredible. He was very arrogant. He was not humble. No way humble. God hates pride. God hates the proud. And this man was full of pride. He believed that salvation was outward. He believed that to be saved was, was a, something in the outside. I accept Jesus with my hands. I'll go in the water. I'll come out of the water. I am saved. But salvation is not outside. Salvation is inside. Salvation is something spiritual and not physical. He believed that the Spirit of God was an economic spirit. It was to receive money. He thought he can buy the money or buy the Spirit so he can use the Spirit to make money for himself. He was a sorcerer. People who practice witchcraft and sorcery, they accept money to perform their sorcery. And he thought he can buy the Holy Spirit's power with money. He had the wrong idea of the Holy Spirit. And he had the wrong view of sin. There was no repentance. He did not ask God for the forgiveness of the sins. His heart was not broken over his condition and his, and his sin. The apostle said, I hope that God has mercy on you and that He will forgive you for your motive, your intention, and your heart. Simon did not say, Oh God, forgive me. Simon said, Oh, please pray, you pray for me, that God will forgive me. There was no repentance. He was not saved. People in the church today, might have the wrong view of God and of Christianity. If you're full of pride, full of arrogance, that's a problem. Salvation is not outward. Some people today believe they can buy the Holy Spirit with their money. They can buy the power of God with their money. There is a word in English, it's called simony. Who's heard of simony? It's a word in English, okay? In Portuguese, it's probably simonia, simonia, something in that area. It is a word that specifically comes from this man's name. It means to buy a position in leadership in the church. It means to buy a spiritual position. That's what simony means. It's a real word. And if you look at church history, there were some popes. Who knows about the popes, okay? The popes, they're corrupt people, my friends, very corrupt. And there was a pope. He sold his position as a pope for money. Someone offered him, look, I'll give you money, and you let me be the pope. He's like, okay, sure. Give me, you know, this amount of money. And he did. He sold his position as a pope to, to another guy for money. Incredible. Maybe in church today, there are some leaders, some people, who try to pay someone to become a pastor or a worship leader. I wouldn't be surprised. I really wouldn't be surprised if that happened. 
There are churches today, leaders in the church today, who use the gospel to steal money from people, from believers, from Christians. They try to sell this like, a, how do you say, anointed handkerchief. If you, if you pay 50 reals right now, this will heal you. This will heal all of your diseases. Okay? They, no. Okay? They, they try to buy people. They try to use the gospel to take people's money and promise them power that is not theirs to give. And unfortunately, this is happening in the church. Unfortunately, this is happening in the church. Why do people come to church today? Some come for the wrong reason. To receive healing. To receive miracles and signs. If you go to church only to see miracles, that's a problem. If you go to church just to see signs and wonders, that is a problem. If you go to church just to receive blessings, that is a problem. If the reason why you came to Christ is to receive a house and a job and all these financial things, that is a big problem. Your motive is completely wrong. And there's a chance you do not have a faith that saves. People who only go to church, who only seek God for financial gain and prosperity, probably do not have a faith that saves them. It is a false faith. And once all of their finances are gone, once all the money is gone, their cars are gone, the house is gone, they turn away from God, and they're like, this is not my God. And this is what's happening here to Simon. He did not know the true God. He was not truly converted. Now we're going to see another example. This one is the opposite, a true conversion. Let's go to verse 26 until the end of the chapter. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, okay? an important official in charge of all the treasury of the candidate, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting on his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began, with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? This next verse is not in all the translations. In the most historical, oldest, manuscript, you will not see verse 37, which says, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both, 
Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on his way rejoicing. <clears throat> Philip, however, appeared at as Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now, right before this, we saw what happened. Philip went to Samaria, performing signs and wonders, and the Samaritans came to Jesus Christ. They were saved by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And if you notice, something happened. Something happened at this moment. They received the news, and then the apostles came, and they couldn't explain what was happening. At that time, remember in Pentecost, the Spirit of God came in Jerusalem. Everyone was talking in different languages that you can understand, okay? It's different than the gift of tongues. The tongues at that moment was an actual language that you can understand. They were speaking all the languages that, they, that the people there that they understood. And here, what many theologians believe, the same exact thing happened. In Samaria, the Spirit of God came, and they all began to speak in tongues, proclaiming, giving glory to God in different languages. And the apostles were amazed. Like, wow, this is incredible. Why didn't this happen at the same time on the day of Pentecost? Why? Most likely it's because God wanted the apostles to be there and to experience this for them to know that God is not a respecter of persons. That God accepts everyone from every tribe, every language, every background to be part of the family of God. Remember, the Jewish people, the people from Israel, they were enemies with the Samaritans. Now the apostles witness that the Samaritans are now part of the family of Jesus Christ. The Samaritans are part of this. Salvation is for the Jews, for the Gentiles, for the Samaritans, for the Brazilians, for the Dutch, for everyone. It is for everyone. It is for everyone. Amen. It is for you. It is for me. Salvation was supposed to be just for one. But God has enabled salvation, the gift of salvation to be available for everyone, from every country, every language, every background, to be saved. This is our God. This is Jesus Christ. He is full of mercy, full of grace, full of love. He is such a good Father. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for second chances. Thank you, Jesus, for accepting us into the family of God. We were not supposed to be part of this family, but God accepted us into this family of believers because He loves everyone. And now, we're going to talk about the faith that saves Remember I said everyone, yes? Mm -hmm. Philip is now going, he's in Gaza, okay? In Gaza, it's basically a desert, but at that time there was a, a path, a road, that goes from Israel to Gaza down to Egypt and the rest of Africa. It was a very popular road people had to go to because there was really no option, okay? That, that's why it was popular. There's no more option to go from Israel back to Africa to Gaza. It was safe at that time if you had like an army, okay? But here's a guy, an Ethiopian, okay? 
I just talked about Jewish people, Gentile people, the Greeks, the Samaritans, and now here's an Ethiopian man. Ethiopia today is not the same as Ethiopia in the past. The kingdom of Ethiopia was a very powerful kingdom. Remember Solomon went to, and he, he went to go, uh, the, the, the queen of Ethiopia sent someone there to go speak about his wisdom and all these different things. At that time it was a very powerful kingdom. And it was much larger than what it is today. A very powerful kingdom. And here is an Ethiopian eunuch. That means his testicles were cut off. Okay? And he came from Israel, going back to his home. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, speaks to Philip. And he commands him to go and speak to the Ethiopian, who is reading out loud the Scriptures. This was an Ethiopian who was a treasurer. He took control of the money. He was very wealthy. That's why he was sitting, and they were pushing him. He had a scroll reading Isaiah. The only people who can have a scroll were people with money. And most likely, he was a Jewish convert. Maybe he, went, maybe he got converted in Israel, and he's coming back. In order to be a Jewish convert, you have to have instruction of the Jewish law. You have to be circumcised, if you're a man. Okay? And you have to be baptized. Okay? Baptism is not a Christian thing. It happened before Christianity. It was a Jewish thing. Christianity is basically Jewish. And this man's reading. And the Spirit of God speaks to him. And he says, Go. Faith that saves. can only come from God Himself. The Spirit of God led Philip to this man. Jesus says, you cannot come to me unless the Father enables you. You cannot come to Christ. You cannot receive saving knowledge of Jesus Christ unless the Spirit of God speaks to you, wakes you up, opens up your eyes. And the Spirit of God is touching this man's heart, this Ethiopian man's heart. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history about Ethiopia at this time. In other translations it says, uh, it mentions the name Candace. Candace is a title like Pharaoh, King, Queen, at the, of the Ethiopians. At that time the kings, they thought they were like uh, the sun god in human form. So the men, they thought they were gods. And if you're a god, you don't do any work. So the women did all the work. The women were the administrators. They took care of the businesses. They took care of everything. So the Candace is the mother of the king. And the mother took care of all of the problems, the administrative problems that they had. That was part of the culture. The men did nothing. They just, they thought they were gods. And those, and this is a man who converted. He didn't, he rejected the Ethiopian gods. And Philip goes and speaks to him. But there's something different between this man and Simon. This man had humility. He was humble. This man wanted to obey God in his heart. This man was hungry for the Word of God. He was thirsty for the truth. One pastor said that what religion does to you, it makes you desire more. It makes you empty. This man went to Jerusalem, found religion, but did not find Jesus Christ. 
but something in his heart. It was a desire in his heart, a hunger for Jesus, a hunger for the Word, a hunger to know the truth. This man had this. Simon did not have this. Simon was proud. Simon was arrogant. Simon wanted to be a god. He wanted to receive recognition. He thought he was a god. But this man was hungry for Jesus. Who's hungry for Jesus? Who's hungry for the word of God? That is what you need. True salvation starts with a desire for God. And he said, I want to be baptized now at this spot, at this location. Remember, they're in a desert. Okay, they're in a desert. This was all led by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit of God. We must be led by the Spirit of God. In order to hear the voice of God, it is a spiritual experience. Usually God does not speak in an audible voice. It is a spiritual experience when God speaks to you. The Bible says we will worship Him in spirit and in truth. When you worship God, when we put on some music, put on the instruments, that is not worship. Worship is not something that is outward. I can stand here, I can close my eyes, I can lift my hands. That's not worship. Worship is something spiritual. Worship is a spiritual experience that you have with God. Worship comes in different ways, in different forms, in different... I can't, it's just different body language. I don't even know how to explain this, okay? Because it's spiritual, okay? <laughs> but you can look spiritual. Someone can be can accept Christ, be baptized, sit here, worship God, lift up their hands, close their eyes, like it's like the spiritual side. Oh, put your hand up, close, now you're spiritual. No, you're not spiritual because of that. Okay, that's... There are satanic priests who go to churches worshiping God. They sing the songs, they lift up their hands, they're not... Worshiping God. It's a spiritual moment with God. It's a, it's a spiritual experience. And this is what's happening here. If you are truly born again, you will have a desire for the Word of God. You have a desire and a hunger for Jesus. And you will be filled with joy. The spirit of joy. When Philip baptized this man and he, and he came back up, Philip disappeared and he was confused at first of Ethiopia and then he's like, and he was filled with joy. That's what the gospel does. You go from confusion to joy in an instant. When you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Baptism. If you are a believer and you are not baptized, get baptized. I don't know why you're waiting. Just do it. Get baptized. Baptism it is a command. It is a moment where you symbolically die, buried, resurrected a new life. And this is what happened to that man. Completely changed. A new creature. A new creation.
true saving faith goes back to the scriptures. True saving faith has a hunger for God. True saving faith knows that you're a sinner and you need a savior, you need help, you need to repent. But also, there is joy. There is joy in your heart when you lose your job, when everything's going bad, there's still something in you. There is joy in your heart because you know that Jesus Christ is going to take care of everything. But the other one was the false salvation. It was an external religious experience. This fake Christian went to church only to receive blessings, money, power, position, glory. He came to church only for signs and wonders. It's amazing. If I start a little conference, okay, congress of the, the, the scriptures, no one's going to go, okay? If I put congress of the, the, the milagres, everyone's going, okay? Everyone is going to go. This is serious. They care more about, more about miracles, signs and wonders than the word of God. This is true. I'm telling you, if I put on Facebook right now, like, I don't know, how am I going to put this? Miracle workshop. Everyone's going to come. Okay? People who don't even speak English are going to come. Okay? People who have said nothing in English will come. If I talk about miracles, if you want to get a new house, a new car, by the power of God, come here. People will come. Do not go to church for signs and wonders. Do not go to church for miracles. Do not go to church so you can receive money and blessings. That should not be your focus. It should be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It should be to grow spiritually. To be hunger, hungry and thirsty for Christ. But thank you, Jesus. For your love and your mercy. Thank you, God, for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Who here is transformed by the Spirit today? Who wants to be transformed? Okay. <laughs> you are transformed. I want to be transformed. Every day we must be transformed, each and every day, more and more, in Jesus' name. Amen. At this moment, I'd like to invite the worship team to come. <laughs> Just remember, persecution will come. Don't try to be super spiritual and create your own persecution, okay? It will happen by itself. It will happen. Your family will reject you. Politics will reject you. Depending on your country, people will kill you because you are a believer. People who are against your ideology will persecute you. But there will come a day when persecution does come, we will be preaching the good news. Everyone will be speaking about Christ. Now, where are you today? Are you like Simon, the sorcerer, who wanted to believe who was who believed Jesus, who believed the message, and who was baptized for a different motive. What is your motive for coming to church? What is your motive for coming to Christ? Is it money? Is it power? Is it recognition? If this is your motive, there is a chance you do not have saving faith. And you must 
repent. Turn away from these things. Have a hunger and a thirst for Jesus and His Word. Forget the signs. Forget the wonders. Forget the miracles. They will happen when they happen. They happen in moments to give glory to God. They will happen when you are about to die for the glory of God. They will happen when you are in danger because of your faith. They will happen to bring people to Jesus Christ. Don't look for them. They will come to you. They will come to you. Don't come to church because you want to be healed, you want to be cured, you want to receive money, you want to receive a job and finances. That should not be your priority. Your priority should be just like that man, the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian Jew. This man, he was desperate for the truth. He was hungry for the truth. He was lost. And he needed salvation. He needed direction. And the Spirit of God heard his cry. The Spirit of God listened to the motives and the thoughts of this man's heart. God will not turn away a seeking heart. He saw a heart that was determined to know the voice of God, to know the Spirit of God, to experience the presence of God. He had a heart that wanted God, but he did not know who this God was. But God heard his cry. And when God hears your cry, He will go after you. He will go after you. And by His Spirit, He will speak to you. Those of us who are in the church today, God has chosen to use you as an instrument to share the gospel. Don't expect the Holy Spirit to do everything. He could. But he's decided to use you, to use me, to share the good news. Let us be led by the Spirit, like Philip. It's incredible. The Spirit of God it was ordained by God every moment, every step, every word. He goes to the to Gaza. And there's an Ethiopian reading from Isaiah about Jesus. And he's like, who's going to teach me about what's here? And there's Philip. He's like, I can teach you. That was all God. He said, go speak to that man. There was a reason. And he says, who is this, this servant? Who is this person? I don't understand what's, what this book Isaiah is talking about. And, he, and Philip said, I will help you. Who will you help today? Who will you help to share the gospel? If you notice, whenever they evangelize, they usually use the Word of God. They used the Word of God. He explained to this man who Jesus was through the Word of God. When Jesus appeared after His resurrection, after He ascended, He appeared again. And he explained to the disciples from the beginning until the end, he showed them everything of what was supposed to happen and who, and who he was. Through the scriptures, he showed who Jesus Christ was. He showed who God was. Let the Spirit guide you. Let the Spirit guide you on who to speak to, on who to speak with, on who to share the gospel with. It's not, you don't have the power to convert anyone. That is the Holy Spirit's power. Only the Holy Spirit can convert someone. Someone who is dead cannot say, oh, I want to be alive. No. Someone that's dead cannot just decide to become alive. The Spirit of life has to give life to someone that is dead in their sins. Just plant the seed. Tell them about Jesus. 
Share your testimony. Give them a word. And let the Holy Spirit allow that seed of faith to grow. And by God's grace, they will come to Christ. If they reject the message, it's not time. If they have no desire for the word, if they have no desire for Jesus, it's not time for salvation yet. The time will come when the Holy Spirit begins to work and transform them. Come to Jesus because you are hungry. Come to Jesus because you are thirsty. Come to Jesus because you want Jesus. Don't come to Him for material possessions. But come to Him because He first loved you. Amen. Let's all stand and let's worship God. And I invite you to come and receive prayer for anything. Maybe you're, you're dry. Maybe you're having difficulty praying. You don't have that hunger for God anymore. You're not thirsty anymore. And you want to be hungry for God. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're not a true believer in Jesus Christ. And you just realized that you are not a true believer. Or maybe you just want to say, God, help me to be led by, the, by your Spirit. For your glory and your glory alone. And when you, are, when you live by the Spirit of God, the signs and the wonders, they will come. The healings will come. The transformation will come. Salvation will come. But it's only through the power of the Spirit, His way, and this time.